Hi, this is Carolyn Kinane at the University of Virginia with a, what I hope to be, a brief video on a version of what contemplative pedagogy can be. So I have found that in talking about pedagogy, critical thinking and creativity in problem solving or creative expression get a lot of attention. And to me, what hasn't gotten a lot of attention are the contemplative processes that can precede critical thinking and creativity. So that is before critiquing an article or an assumption or a theory, it could be useful to sit with it on its own terms and give it a generous reading and consider what I might learn from it. That is, I can create contemplative space to notice non-judgmentally, to look again, to bring attention and curiosity to it, possibly be transformed by that encounter, and then move into critique, analysis, and revision. So similar with problem solving in science and engineering, hyper-focused attention, rumination, or avoidance can be unproductive mind states when they're not paired with open awareness. So some contemplative processes that I have found to be helpful supports to critical thinking and problem solving and creativity and ethical action are presence, observation, receptivity, and reflection. But there are others. And we could actually stop right here because a main takeaway could be let's consider what I as a teacher could look like or what a student experience could look like if I valued these processes as much as I did other processes or the product of education. So you can stop right now or you can continue with me and um, you may have seen this before. So quick reactivity, habitual unthinking reactions can lead me to develop solutions and behave in ways that are out of line with my values, which causes some crisis down the road. So it can be useful to think of contemplative practices as introducing a gap or a pause between a stimulus and a response. So basically, I see contemplation as an act that brings awareness to habitual ways of being and doing things so that I can decide whether that's really how and who I want to be. So we have a stimulus and a reaction. I get an alert and I check it. A student asks something in class and I answer. The student is asked to respond to a text and they read it and they write something. Contemplation opens up space for this contemplative pause to check in with my values, bring awareness to the moment, see what else is around me and what is needed, rather than react, respond rather than react. And this pausing can be really difficult for me to do in a stressful situation. And that's the, why the idea of practice is important. So if I practice taking this pause intentionally during moments of calm or when I'm alone, it's easier for me to take the pause when I am under stress or taken off guard. So practice helps me develop new habits. Okay, so contemplative pedagogy um, can mean taking this pause yourself as an instructor while teaching remaining present with what is happening, abiding in self-awareness, nurturing connection, working in a values-aligned way. It can mean can take, taking a contemplative approach to course design, setting intentions or course goals that are values-aligned, having transparency with students in goals and assessment, reflecting on your teaching practice. And it can also mean helping students to take this pause to notice their own habits of mind and make choices about how to connect with one another in course materials. And we'll look at um, the first one later. So we're going to look at the interrelated second and third one a bit more. So overall, contemplative pedagogy can refer to a style of teaching that uses meditative techniques from contemplative traditions to explore traditional course content and skills. And, <laughs> and these techniques are not merely about secularizing some Buddhist practices and using them for stress reduction, although contemporary mainstream certainly conveys that. And I highly recommend the work of my colleague, Patricia Jennings, for a specific focus on mindfulness in the classroom. 
But as many of you probably know very well, there are rich and deep histories of contemplation as a mode of inquiry, as an epistemological stance. And it's this mode of contemplation that I believe holds great promise for enriching the important critical thinking, creative expression, and problem solving that we may be teaching in our disciplines. For today, for right now, I'm just going to focus on three aspects of contemplative pedagogy in college classrooms. And that is that it involves and creates dispositions. It's important how we are being with a person, a situation, or an idea. This is an attitude, a stance, or a state of mind that can be marked by curiosity, receptivity, humility, a willingness to be transformed. It's also process rather than product focused in its attention to how we get there. And it honors that the process itself can be what transforms us. And it also builds capacity for and aims at awareness and connection rather than economic gain, expediency, and competition. And what this will look like will depend on your goals and skills. Practices, assignments, exercises often fall into, from what I've noticed, three categories. So um, there may be individual practices involving stillness and movement, focus, attention, uh, general well-being. There may also be relational exercises like contemplative looking and listening and reading. Um, there are also generative assignments that are based on contemplative inquiry where students first person experiences become the subject of inquiry, generating and creating meaning. And I will give you some ideas in the sense of each of these, but first a, a little caution. I found that there's sometimes a temptation to start with technique, that people are interested in meditation or mindfulness and deep listening. And that's fine, but I have found that contemplative pedagogy is, has been a little more effective for me when I start with my goals. Contemplative practices are transformative. So what is it that I want transformed? What habits and skills are students currently practicing that can be complemented? So you may be wanting some quick tips and specific activities, um, which, which kind of gets at this bottom half here, but I'm going to stay up here because my goal is not to tell you what to do, but pr to provide tools for you to reflect on your intentions and contexts so that you can decide what to do or um, reach out to me for a consultation. We can decide together what techniques are most appropriate for your discipline goals and contexts. So, Contemplative pedagogy balances our interest in what we think students should know and do, the content and skills of our disciplines with how they want to be, with how they want to move through the world and how we hope for them to move through the world. So the content of your field may be equations or poetry or anatomy and your fields skills may involve conducting experiments, writing, performing surgery, but there is also a way of being that gets ingrained as, uh, got ingrained in me anyway, as I learned to become um, a literary critic. Um, there may be a way of being that gets ingrained in you as you became an engineer or a medical practitioner or a research scientist or professor. Sometimes it's explicit, but I have found that often there's a hidden dispositional curriculum. So we can, in some fields, develop dispositions of suspicion of a patient's ability to know what's wrong with themselves, with the text's capacity to have meaning, um, intolerance for ambiguity or diversity, let's get to the right answer as quickly as possible, of fear-based competition where someone else's success might make me look bad. These aren't bad ways to be sometimes, but they just aren't our only way of being, and they may not be the best way to be in various circumstances. And so. Contemplative pedagogy in my framework asks us to bring some intention to, to how we're showing up in class and also to how assignments and courses are shaping students' ways of being, their dispositional habits. When they're writing papers, are students practicing being competitive, isolated, judgmental? When they're doing field research, are they practicing patience, observation, collaboration, generosity? 
So I just want to plant a seed to surface disposition as a third part of educational endeavors, supporting content and skills. And it's one that relies on contemplative processes of awareness and reflection. So a second part, contemplative pedagogy as process focused. So if I want to bring attention to how I and students, how we're being with one another and with course material, that means bringing attention to process. And so this means that I can orient my classes, assignments, and activities so that students can give this contemplative attention, this time and space to a thing or a person or an idea. And along the way, students can learn something about themselves as well as about the course material. So this could mean that students do a deep and close reading of a text that precedes analysis and critique a deep and close listening to a person or a piece of music that precedes discussion and debate, deep and close observation of a natural or social phenomenon that precedes interpretation and analysis. And I know some, some of you may be thinking, I already do this. I tell students all the time to do this. Let me suggest I've noticed that when I tell students to do things, I may expect them to do it, but when I don't explicitly give students time and space to do it, and when I don't authentically value it using the existing mode of currency, making it visible in, ass in assessments and activities like a grade, students, my students have been more likely to skip this contemplative process and leap to producing the critical or the creative product. And so I found that it's useful for me to link the contemplative process to course goals and objectives, to give students time and space to do this, and also to assess the process. So I can make process visible by naming the points on the journey and linking them with skills and disposition as well as course content. And so assignments can be scaffolded so that each stop on the way to a product is visible, where you're practicing, where you're observing, where you're describing, noticing, wondering, inquiring, questioning, engaging, interacting, analyzing, synthesizing, creating, arguing, proposing, reflecting, revising, right? Um, all of these things can be visible. Uh, we can make the contemplative process visible. And in that way, I like to think of it as balancing students' attention to what they will argue, create, demonstrate, or prove their product with their attention to their process and their existing environments. So there's a level of interconnectedness here as, um, as I invite students to think about their scholarly environments, their creative environments, natural, their social environments. And so the learning objectives for such activities might be to develop habits of patience, awareness, humility, generosity, metacognition, or whatever you choose for your assignment goals, to learn effective strategies of process, observation, perspective taking, reflection, to value scholar scholarly context, intellectual community, interconnectivity. So all of this, to me, it doesn't have to take attention away from my discipline, but it can actually deepen students' engagement with the materials of my discipline. Okay, awareness and connection. So I've already talked about a few forms of awareness to disposition, to process, to how we're being, not just what we're doing. And I'm sure many of us are already designing activities and assignments that develop a sense of community, helping students be seen, valuing the whole person, demonstrating your own care, things like one word check-ins, games, icebreakers, authentic conversations. And these kinds of things might be thought of as fun icebreakers and they do build social presence and real learning is also happening. These are often activities that cultivate awareness and connection of the self and other. So you may be familiar with, um, oh, here we go. <laughs> so you may be familiar with practices such as anchoring attention and one-word check-ins, activities that bring course concepts to personal life, exercises such as dyad listening. And so my invitation here is to link these activities into course goals, to really be explicit about how they cultivate perspective taking, 
self-awareness, how they build speaking and listening skills. So um, with contemplative listening, it enhances social presence. It can offer students an opportunity to practice awareness of their own habits of mind as they're listening and connection, which could help build towards empathetic concern. And so um, the invitation is to think of these as, as not just um, quick, fun icebreakers, but to, to think about the, you know, quote unquote, real learning that can happen here. So there can be what we ask students to do and what they do, and in between a pause to notice how we're being, how we're doing, and in that space, awareness, connection, and reflection can be brought to bear on um, critical and creative endeavors. So this can show up for ourselves as instructors when we teach a class, when we make an assignment, when we open the Zoom, to pause and notice and be intentional and get aligned and reflect. Um, it doesn't all just have to show up in our course design and what we do with students. So I firmly believe we can all be contemplative instructors without ever once inviting our students to meditate in class. In class. And so um, just a brief transition here to um, you know, I'm going to like explicitly offer advice unsolicited. Um, I would just invite folks to consider that you um, start with your goals, not with the practice when you um, are thinking about bringing contemplative processes to students. Why do you want to do this? And focus on the process and then design the activity or the exercise that will fulfill that goal. Um, practices are transformative. And so be explicit about what you hope is transformed. I would also um, think it'd be great if faculty who do teach contemplative practices themselves have a practice. For me, I find it very useful to have a fractal perspective where every, um, every element of the whole is reflected in every part. And um, it fi I find it really useful to consistently strive for integrity and authenticity. That's what my practice of contemplative pedagogy does for, for me. So just an invitation to consider that. I have found I've had to prioritize my students over my discipline. Um, that is finding the human heart of my discipline, being okay with releasing some content and coverage to make room for human experiences. When I do advise faculty on one-on-one -on -one consultations, it's always so important to consider our context. What are you comfortable with? Don't do as an instructor something you're not comfortable with. Um, honor your own boundaries. There's a reason for that discomfort. Explore it and then see if you want to move past that and expand your comfort zone or understand that that resistance contains some wisdom. What are the power dynamics and positionalities in the room? Give students choice and options. Be intentional with, with your vocabulary and strive for diversity in terms of approach, assessments, and language that you use. Okay, um, hope this was helpful. Please reach out anytime. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, carolyn.canane at gmail is my email address.